This is CBC Here and Now. Parents have had enough. They want their children playing sports back inside the schools. They really need to be active and on the go. Uh, I can't understand why we don't have access to the school gymnasiums at this time. That's coming up. Teddy's bringing warm temperatures and high waves, but how long is this going to last? Jeff Budden started representing survivors of Mount Cashel back in the 1990s. Today, the St. John's Diocese says it is not liable for what happened with the Christian brothers, and they want to take their case to the Supreme Court. With the mental illness that he has, in a room in a bed with bugs crawling on him, it's a, it's a form of torture. Mold, bed bugs. She says her brother's apartment should be condemned. So why is he still living there? Welcome to Here and Now, I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Anthony Germain. We begin tonight in Kilbride. It's a story about a sister's desperate plea for help for her mentally ill brother. His family says his living conditions are inhumane and a threat to his health. The government says he'll just have to wait. Here now sees Hare has our top story. A bathroom in a one bedroom apartment in a building in Kilbride. The toilet leaks newspapers on the floor. The ceiling leaks black water. Then there's the mold. The bathroom is in Bob Moore's apartment. He's 63 and has two chronic disorders, schizophrenia and bipolar, serious enough that he's been unable to work for the last 10 years. His sister, Dolores Moore, took these images. When she takes them, she wears plastic bags on her feet. It's inhumane, actually. The bathroom needs to be condemned right across, you know, up to the ceiling, which there is a leak in the ceiling. And it's not just black mold, like it's, it's got like dots and spores and like go right around, you close the bathroom door, it's on the bathroom door, it's on the vanity on the side, like it's all over the place. It didn't happen overnight. Her brother tried verbally for years to get things fixed. Then this summer, bed bugs appeared. With the mental illness that he has, with you know, uh, in a room in a bed with bugs crawling on it. It's, it's a form of torture. Newfoundland and Labrador Housing Corporation pays three quarters of his rent. So in early August, Bob Moore applied for a transfer. It was denied. An August 14th letter says Moore did not meet the eligibility criteria for a transfer. And the transfer was not justified because you are adequately housed. They did an investigation. They never spoke to Bob. They never spoke to me. They came to a conclusion without asking the person who's the victim who put in the complaint about it what they thought. Undeterred, Dolores persisted, writing letters to the housing corporation, to politicians, then some progress. A letter from the minister stating Bob's request to move had been approved, but because he asked for a place only in St. John's East, this limitation may cause a delay. Dolores Moore says delays won't do. I've been on the phone as a full-time job for the last six weeks trying to get somebody to help. And, you know, it's like, yes, he got his transfer, but when? You know, is he going to be there the winter? Like, not good enough. She wants him moved immediately to a new temporary location until his transfer is completed. It's not unusual. Uh, unfortunately, we hear these stories and see these kinds of situations all too frequent. The reason for that, say mental health advocates, is fear. Mental health and addictions is known as the invisible disease, and we stay quiet a lot of times because sometimes the conditions that we live in are better than no conditions at all. Um, so there is that notion and a real fear that if I verbalize, if I complain to my landlord, if I call, um, you know, a housing department, if I make some noise about where I'm living, then I will possibly uh, end up homeless. Bob Moore's doctor says his living conditions could hurt him. This letter to the housing corporation says his current accommodations have negatively affected his physical and mental health. The mold has caused respiratory issues and goes on to say all this has increased anxiety and stress. His sister is also worried about his health. I don't want him to have a, you know, a relapse in his, his mental health. He's been really good 
taken his medication for the last 10 years. Like, you know, this could be detrimental to him, you know, and could send him down a path that he mightn't come back from. Moore feels the housing corporation has a bigger role in protecting people from this sort of thing. They should have some say in it, and they should be looking after the people that you're giving money to. If you're subsidizing people, then you're responsible to make sure that where they live is livable, and you need to check up on that. You need to have some sort of a person that goes around and speaks to the people in, in, the, in the building, not to the landlord. The housing corporation that pays for most of Moore's rent won't comment, claiming concerns for his privacy. CCR, CBC News, St. John's. Well, Killam Properties owns the apartment. It's a Halifax company with units in seven provinces. In a letter to CBC, Killam's director of property management says they weren't aware of Bob Moore's ongoing bathroom problems and only found out about maintenance issues in a letter from the housing corporation in late August. The company says now that it's aware the problems will be addressed as soon as the bed bug issue is under control. Killam says Moore's apartment is the only unit in Infected and his infestation has not spread to other apartments. The province is expected to roll out its flu vaccination plan later this fall, but at least one part of that program was announced today. You'll soon be able to get your flu shot from your family doctor. And if the sight of needles makes you squirm, you may want to look away during this story. Here and now is Mark Quinn reports. Newfoundland and Labrador doctors will now be able to bill the province to do this. In 2017, the provincial government stopped paying physicians $17 each time they gave a flu vaccine. But this year, as part of an effort to increase the influenza vaccination rate, they're paying doctors to give flu shots again. I think it's important that the family physicians uh, open up their offices to do that. We're actually getting tons of requests already uh, from patients who've been very worried about the, the options of going to large public halls to get vaccines that they've done in the last few years. The Medical Association says it's been told it's a temporary measure that they'd like to see made permanent. Today, the health minister explained why the province is paying doctors and pharmacists to give shots again this year. Our concern this year is that we are going to have, we hope, a very big demand for administration of flu shots. Pharmacists and physicians, it is well within their scope. Uh, my uh, aim would be to have these individuals actually giving flu shots, and we have to recognize that with compensation. The province hasn't announced details of this year's mass influenza vaccination plan yet. It's expected to include public immunization clinics like the ones run by the regional health authorities last year. About 30% of the province's residents received a flu shot last year. The province hopes to bring that number up to 80% this year. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, we're just over a month away from Halloween, and with a pandemic underway, what will happen to trick-or-treating? We have good news if you're looking forward to dressing up. Here and now, Peter Cowan joins us live with more. So, Peter, what did you learn about the plans for Halloween today? Carolyn, if a pandemic isn't scary enough for you, the good news is you can expect ghosts and goblins to be running around on October 31st. The message today from the Chief Medical Officer of Health was Halloween is not cancelled, but like everything else in life, it'll probably look a little different and there are some people who won't be able to go trick-or-treating. Feeling ill or are self-isolating for any reason, do not go trick-or-treating. Similarly, ask someone else to hand out your treats or place a sign on your door to ask parents and children to skip your home. And if you see these signs, please be respectful and kind to these families as they may be disappointed about not being able to participate this year. They're working on full guidance on exactly what you should or shouldn't do in order to stay safe while getting candy or handing it out. A lot will also depend on what happens with COVID-19 in this province over the next five weeks. Other provinces are encouraging people to only trick or treat within their bubble. That won't be necessary here unless the number of cases changes. If we were to see an increase in cases um, of COVID uh, in the next five weeks, 
uh, then you know the safest uh, recommendation at that point would be to trick or treat within your um, you know your close friends, your extended bubble, that sort of thing. Uh, so, Carolyn, you do have lots of time still to be able to pick out a Halloween costume. Yeah, it should be uh, pretty easy because uh, we're already wearing masks, so probably going to see a lot of ninjas and superheroes this year. Absolutely, a way to be able to celebrate and still stay safe. And before I go, one thing I should mention is Dr. Janice Fitzgerald is taking a few weeks off, so she's not going to be at the weekly briefings for the next couple of weeks. And uh, John Hagee said in case she needs any help, he's offered to surgically remove her phone from her <laughs> hand so that she gets a little bit of rest and relaxation. She definitely deserves it. Thank you so much, Peter. Take a look at this. This was the scene earlier this afternoon in Port of Basque. High surf and we can Thank Hurricane Teddy for that, or uh, rather post-tropical storm Teddy for that. Let's take a look at some of the numbers. There you're seeing uh, waves probably about eight to nine meters, but uh, we did record, or at least the uh, buoy recorded, a 17.6 meter wave earlier this afternoon just off the coast of Port of Basque, and then even uh, Placentia, 11 meter wave this afternoon. So uh, not only is Teddy bringing those high waves, but we are seeing those warmer temperatures as well. This was uh, the temperatures today, anywhere from 19 to 23 degrees, humid as well. Humidex value is feeling more like 25, anywhere from 22 to 25. And then we did see rain overnight last night. This is what, uh, anywhere from 20 to 30 millimeters, not too much in the way, but those winds were breezy. Certainly in the rec house area, 131 kilometer per hour winds uh, earlier today, sitting around 111 earlier this afternoon. And uh, as Teddy continues to near the or just off the coast, rather the southwest portion of Labrador or, uh, of the island. It's going to head towards the strait as we head tonight, which means uh, improving conditions. So I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, despite the controversy, cost overruns, delays, protests and a public inquiry, Nalcor says the Muskrat Falls project has finally generated first power. Here and now's Heather Gillis has more on this major milestone. Power flowed from the Muskrat Falls project for the first time Tuesday night. According to a news release from Nalcor, the first generating unit was successfully synced to the electricity grid in Labrador. They say that unit will be tested over the next few weeks, put on and off the grid before it's ready for operations and put into service later this fall. The power generated during commissioning will be added to Labrador's electricity grid. Nalcor calls it a significant milestone reached with the help of the Innu Nation, their contractors, unions and workers. But they acknowledge the challenges and delays getting here. The project was first sanctioned by Premier Kathy Dunderdale in December 2012. The construction of the 824 megawatt hydro project on the Churchill River began the following year. Then the project was pegged at 7.4 billion and first power was expected at the end of 2017. Since then the project has been mired in controversy as costs doubled to 12.7 billion. There have been delays, protests by indigenous groups in Labrador and a public inquiry. In March, Justice Richard LeBlanc, the inquiry's commissioner, released a scathing report that said the government failed in its duty to safeguard the best interests of the province's residents. And Nalcor frequently concealed information about the project's schedule, costs and risks. Meanwhile, commissioning of the Labrador Island Link, which will bring power to the island, is on pause while there's an investigation into an equipment failure as contractor General Electric continues to work on the software needed to make the little work. Nalcor CEO Stan Marshall wasn't available for an interview today, but a spokesperson says they'll likely give an update on the project by the end of this month. Meanwhile, the second power generating unit will be online later this year. The third and fourth units will come online in 2021. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Well, Gander and Deer Lake airports are seeing a huge dip in air traffic. Deer Lake is reporting a $2.5 million loss this year. Travel almost stopped in April and was only at about 15 and 20% of normal for both July and August. And in Gander, to date this year, passengers are down 70%.
The airport is expecting to see 50,000 passengers total when it's used to seeing about 177,000 passengers every year. Well, police responded to a robbery this afternoon at the Credit Union in Mount Pearl. It happened on Commonwealth Avenue at around 1.30. Police say a man entered the bank and made away with an undisclosed amount of cash. It's believed that a black Honda sedan was used in that getaway. The RNC is searching for a male suspect, six feet tall, medium build. He was wearing a dark puffy jacket, a black neck covering as a face mask and a black ball cap. He was carrying a reusable Sobeys bag. Anyone with information or possibly dash cam or CCTV footage is asked to contact police or Crime Stoppers. School may be back in session, but sports are still a big no-go. With all the COVID-19 rules, students don't have access to school gymnasiums to play sports after hours, and that has concerned parents and coaches taking a stand. Here now's Colleen Connors takes us to the West Coast. A pickup game after school, something students are not allowed to do this year. The school board suspended all after-school community-based sports in school gyms. And one parent and coach does not agree. I can't understand why we don't have access to the school gymnasiums at this time. He started a group called Reinstate Indoor School Sports on Facebook. Thousands are backing him. Well, we could go on about the fitness uh, benefits and the mental health benefits of extracurricular activities for, for an hour, I'm sure, right? Just it makes great leaders, so on and so forth. And the, the benefits of sport are, you know, there's so many. But the reason why I'm really pushing this is because where we don't have any community transmission, I think we could come up with safe plans with obviously government leading us from what they've been doing so far and to just come up with a way to do this. And, you know, there's parents out there who are willing to help. Well, because students cannot play sports in the gyms in their schools, many families in the evenings on the West Coast are hitting the highway to come here to Pasadena Place, where they're paying to rent the space so that their kids can play basketball, volleyball, and other sports. This place has a waiting list of people wanting to use their indoor gym, desperate to continue to play sports. This mom brings her sons from Cornerbrook to Pasadena twice a week. Well, you know, it's it's not ideal, that's for sure. It's, you know, I'm a single parent of two busy boys and I'm rushing from work and rushing to get home and slapping peanut butter on bread and driving up the highway like a maniac. But, you know, we do it because we feel it's the best thing for our kids right now. Drover backs Carpenter's ideas and feels sports is crucial for her children. For kids, you know, especially in that early teen and teenage years, I think it's a very vulnerable time. And, you know, having some sense of connection to your school and pride in your school and having uh, a little bit of a regular schedule, I think is so important at that age. CBC asked the school district about the use of school gyms. It referred to the website where it says all community use is suspended for the health and safety of students and staff. Some after-school programs are allowed, but the guidelines aren't clear. Well, Carpenter says if the government doesn't change its rules and start allowing students to play sports inside, then he and his followers are going to take their voices outside and have a public rally next week. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Pasadena. Well, some worry a long-time institution in Newfoundland and Labrador may not survive. It's steeped in our military history and has long provided supports for veterans and their families. A network of Legion branches say they're now buckling in the wake of COVID-19. Here now is Terry Roberts has this report. Okay, any typical Friday night here or Saturday night, we would have probably 150, 200 people here uh, packed in for a wedding or an anniversary party. Legion Branch 1 in St. John's has been Greg Grenning's second home for four decades. I'm saddened about this because, uh, you know, I've given so much. His late father was also a president after fighting in Korea. I'm sort of glad he's not here right now because if he was here to see this, it, if he wasn't dead already, it would probably kill him anyway. Like much of society, the pandemic has caused tremendous upheaval for service organizations like the Legion. Physical distancing rules have practically stripped these clubs of their ability to generate money. Events like weddings, anniversaries, dart leagues, and bingo. I say uh, probably since April until December, we're losing on average of uh, forty to $50,000 a month. Business has all but dried up, 
And the message from some legionnaires is an ominous one. All our programs that we do for veterans and uh, cadet leagues and the service to our veterans and the widows and the dependents, that's all going to be gone. And so who's going to take care of our veterans when all of this is, uh, if the legion's got to close up? Staff have either been laid off or had their hours slashed. I loved my job from the day I came here, and I still love my job right now. And I'd hate to see the Legion close up for any reason at all. Branches like this one have had to get creative. Take out meals on Wednesdays and Sundays, and uh, we started a drive-in bingo, which has been a great help to us. That's how we've been surviving, just trying to keep the doors open right now. It's not Anki Dory, we're having problems. It's a heavy burden on the shoulders of this man, the top Legionnaire never imagined a potential scenario like this. There are 45 branches, of which 50%, 22 are on the verge of going, uh, going down. And we're doing everything in our power to uh, help those smaller branches out. The Legion movement in this province took root after the First World War. Prior to Confederation, it was known as the Great War Veterans Association. A history of giving, but for the first time, looking for help. You look at those who, who came before us, those who paid the supreme sacrifice, those who built the legions and uh, are not no longer with us and it's our responsibility to keep the legion going in their memory and in their name and, and for their families. That, that's why it's important to us. The national leadership has gone to Ottawa for aid, but so far nothing. Nathan Lear has also written Premier Andrew Fury. I hate the bag, honest to God almighty, because we're the ones that usually help out everybody. But we need, all we need is just to keep our buildings going. And that's it. You're not even allowed to get up and have a karaoke night there and, and sing a few songs. Or Their fighting spirit is alive. There's still a lot of pride out there. But pride people, won't pay the bills. And a feared second COVID lockdown could spell the end. Nathan Lear says that's a scenario that must be avoided at all costs. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. These bees are among the best in the business, and the reason why is they're varroa free. So everybody says you're going to get it, but we have a big moat around Newfoundland. It only takes one varroa mite to uh, infest a hive. I'm Garrett Berry, and I'll bring you that story coming up on here now. The setup in the upper atmosphere spells good news as far as temperatures go across the province. I'll have all the details coming up.
This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. Take the time to explore this fall. Learn more at stayhomeyear.ca. Well, earlier we showed you the scene in Port of Bass. This was the scene this afternoon in Sandbanks Provincial Park in Burgio. Wow, those waves are pretty rough. Do we know how high? They got well a forecast to you know see six to nine meter waves but uh, as I mentioned earlier Porta Bass saw 17 meter wave earlier today so certainly high surf that's yeah right. <laughs> thanks to uh, Janet for sending that video in mm -hmm. so we got through the storm today not too bad in St. John's we just saw a lot of rain but it was nice and mild at least there was that <laughs> mild <laughs> temperatures for sure that's certainly what the story was across most of the province let's take a look at those numbers we saw high near uh, 19 degrees in St. John's that's exactly where we're sitting right now and current temperatures pretty much across the board the warm spot at the moment is Twilling Gate at 21 degrees. Then we've got some of those cooler temperatures up through Labrador, 7 degrees in Makovic and 13 in Lab City. So here's a look at, uh, we're losing the daylight now, but here's a look at where uh, the remnants or what is post-tropical storm Teddy. And uh, as we head through the night tonight, that is going to race towards the Strait of Belle Isle. We'll still see some showers along with that, certainly along the southern portion of the island and then head towards southeastern portions of Labrador as well. So you'll see periods of rain continue as we head through the overnight. Otherwise, we're just looking at some showers and drizzle through um, the early morning hours, mainly for the rest of the province. Here's where our temperatures will sit. So we're going to dip a little bit back into the 11 to 13 degree range. Those winds are going to stay breezy as well. So they're going to shift anywhere from southerlies to southwesterlies, uh, 40 to 60 kilometers per hour. Exposed areas could see higher gusts as well. And then we've got uh, temperatures around seven degrees for Cartwright. Again, you're going to see those periods of rain four for Lab City and seven for Nain as well. Now tomorrow, not a whole lot happening. Once uh, Teddy moves off, we're going to see that westerly flow. And with that, the potential for some lingering drizzle and cloud cover, certainly on the west coast. Otherwise, it will be a lovely afternoon, sun peeking out and then just some showers possible up through Labrador. Then late day into Lab City, we're going to get into some of that cooler air. And that means we could see the potential for flurries in the overnight, even northern portions of Labrador, you could see that as well. Uh, temperature is going to be mild again tomorrow, 15 to 17, 18 degrees, maybe uh, nearing the 19 degree mark for Gander. But again, those winds will stay brisk. So westerlies or southwesterlies, 50 to as much as 60 kilometer per hour uh, winds expected. And then up through Labrador, same thing, gusty along the coast, certainly uh, 40 to 70 kilometer per hour winds. Temperatures will stay in the teens across the uh, east southeastern portion and then Lab City hanging on to about four degrees. As we head into Friday, looks beautiful. Temperatures will stay mild again, a little cooler along the west coast, but overall 14 to 18 degrees through the day, 12 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. And then again, some of that colder air for Lab City. That will generally continue as we head into Saturday. Uh, about nine degrees will be the afternoon high for you. You're going to hang on to the chance of showers. Otherwise, maybe a few showers along the west coast, uh, around 17 degrees for Corner Brook, and then plenty of sunshine for the rest of the province. 16 degrees will be the afternoon high in St. John's. Now, over the next week or so, it's looking nice. So this is the upper atmosphere, and this uh, is generally where the jet stream is, and that carries systems around. It also denotes where the cold air is to the north and the warmer air down to the south. Now, the setup over the next week or so, certainly heading into the first week of October, is to get this big dip in the jet stream, and that's going to drive down some of that cooler air. But because uh, we're on that ridge and we're going to see some of that warmer air. It's actually going to be fairly humid with warmer temperatures right into the middle of next week and then even into the first week of October. So certainly something to look forward to over the next little bit. It's going to be quiet weather wise. We're just looking at sunshine for the most part through Saturday temperatures in the teens and then back into that 20 degree range. And again, gonna pull up some of that milder, more humid air, flirting with the 20 degree mark, overnight temperatures into the teens. That's where we should be sitting as our daily highs for this time of year. A few, chance of a few showers on Sunday, but overall, it is looking like a, a pretty summery uh, start to October for sure. Uh, for central Newfoundland, you're looking at similar temperatures even into the mid uh, 20s as we head into the middle of next week. And again, those overnight lows into the teens. 
So you certainly don't have to worry about frost for the next little bit so you can get your tomatoes uh, to continue to ripen because mine aren't ripe yet. And then for eastern Labrador, you're looking at about uh, 12 degrees through Friday and Saturday. Then we get a little bit unsettled with some shower potentials. And then for western Labrador, similar uh, forecast, 11 degrees by Sunday. Monday, you're looking at 10 and a return of that potential for some showers. I wanted to share this lovely shot. Look at this foggy morning on Indian Bay Pond and uh, Pond West, rather, in the West Coast. Thank you so much to uh, Dina for sending that shot in. And if you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Well, thanks, Ashley. Uh, look, Carolyn Stokes Fan Club has shown up. Uh, the Province's Beekeeping Association wants to fight a deadly mite. Beekeepers want to stop the varroa mite from finding its way into our province's bee colonies. But the problem is they still want bees from elsewhere to also be brought here, but that brings risks. This province is one of the few areas in the world that doesn't have this lethal pest. The CBC's Garrett Barry has more. You're looking at some of the best in the business. We have something in this province that we can be proud of, our varroa feet status. That's pretty rare. They haven't succeeded in doing it anywhere else. It's an important selling point for products, and it means less maintenance for beekeepers, because they'd have to treat varroa with chemicals. Plus, the mite would make the bees weaker. Uh, with our long winters and what our climate is like, it'd be very challenging uh, to actually keep the hives alive. This mite is a menace. Everybody agrees on that. But there are different ideas on how to keep it away. There's a faction of beekeepers in this province who want to ban all bee importation. They say it's the only way to keep the mite out. But the Beekeepers Association has a different opinion. And frankly, I haven't met anybody outside of Newfoundland who's optimistic that we can keep this parasite out of here. But uh, you know, our membership at the 2018 AGM said we want to we want to do our damnedest to keep this parasite out of here because you know, we, we could lose most of our honeybees. This man is one of three authors behind the Beekeeping Association's new plan to allow bees in and keep the mite out. And you shove this in the front entrance of the beehive. It calls for a big increase in testing and monitoring at hives and at shipping routes. Every beekeeper can do this. And frankly, if we get varroa mites here in Newfoundland, Every bee beekeeper is going to be doing this anyways, because if they don't, their colonies will die. Armitage says there's a lot of parallels between Varroa and our own human pandemic, COVID-19. And the Varroa Action Plan calls for its own version of contact tracing. As part of the Varroa Action Plan, we recommend that beekeepers uh, register their bee yards with the provincial apiarist. So that if you do have an incursion, the provincial apiarist can rapidly track down all of the beekeepers in the area. If Varroa is there, the bees can be killed off before they spread it to other hives. Beekeeping has grown as an industry and as a hobby. The association says there were six keepers in this province 10 years ago. Now there's a hundred. There's also lots of demand and that can be a Varroa pressure point if people try to skip the line with illegal imports. Be patient in buying your nucleus colonies. We're trying to grow. Um, so have some patience and, and some learning in that too. Um, there's a lot of strain right now trying to meet that, that demand. And that's where the risk of having Varroa come in comes from. It's so easy to transport something from the mainland here. He says part of the plan is getting all the new beekeepers ready. If it's detected, we might have a chance at eradicating it. But this is going to take the cooperation of all beekeepers in the province. And it's going to take some discipline. Garrett Barry, CBC News, Portland. Well, just before we head to the break, one last report for you, and this one is from a budding reporter in Grand Falls, Windsor. Seven-year-old Noah Bowers, along with his little brother and sister, have taken up gardening. Just take a look. On your street, hoo, hoo, hoo. on your street, hoo, hoo, hoo. on your street, hoo, hoo, hoo. on your street. He, he, he. Hi, I am Noah Bowers, reporting in Grand Falls, Windsor. I am about to ha harvest some carrots that I grew this summer from, with the help from my brother and sister. Now put your knowledge. This is Noah Bowers in Grand Falls, Windsor. Back to you, CBC. On your street. 
<laughs> well, thank you, Noah. You've learned that the art to reporting is to get right to the point, and uh, your carrots look absolutely fantastic. I'll bet you they taste great. Just fantastic. A budding gardener. And uh, if you have a young reporter in your household, we would love to hear from you. you just head to cbc.ca slash nl and go to the community page. Welcome back to Here and Now. We're going to turn now to a story that has been in the news in this province for decades now, a serious story, and that's Mount Cashel. The St. John's Diocese today announced that it intends to go to the Supreme Court to challenge whether it's liable for the abuse that happened at the orphanage. Jeff Budden started representing victims, or I should say survivors of Mount Cashel back in the 1990s. Mr. Budden, what's your reaction to the diocese's decision? We're not surprised. We've been expecting this. Uh, we were given a bit of a heads up, but even without that, we've known for some years now that the Archdiocese seems intent on litigating this until they run out of legal options. Now, the abuse, I think, first came to light in the 70s. We've seen a royal commission. There was the 80s and 90s, and here it is 2020. Why has this taken so long? Why hasn't this chapter, this dark chapter, been closed? For decades, of course, the survivors did not come forward. It was not a welcoming atmosphere. And these are not things that people lightly discuss. 
The legal process itself was complex. The brothers that were running Mount Cashel in that era were based in the States. We had a 10-year legal battle to uh, determine that the courts here had authority over them and so forth. So there, it's a complex case. There's been a lot of legal obstacles, and unfortunately, the defendants have never shown any serious interest in resolving them outside of court. So with respect to your clients, without getting into too much detail, how do you, as a lawyer, talking to a client, how do you explain to them, okay, guys, you know, here we go again. You know, there's another court, another court proceeding that's not done yet. How do you explain that to someone who's been through what we know happened? We've uh, been up front with our clients about the process. Uh, when we got the, the very successful Court of Appeal decision, we advised our clients at that time that an appeal was certainly possible. So we try, we do keep them in the loop about how the process is unfolding. And also, these are, these are tough guys. They've obviously been through a lot worse in their life than this court process. And they're, they're patient men. They're not, going to, they're not going to give up. Now, the appeal court ruled that the diocese was liable for what happened. Now the diocese has decided to take that appeal and try to get what you lawyers talk about, leave of appeal, to get to see if the Supreme Court will actually hear this appeal. Nobody denies the abuse, right? I mean, there, there's agreement on that fact? That's correct. The, there's agreement. It was not an issue at trial. Everybody conceded these men were abused as they said they were. Are they tough enough to wait this out even longer than they have? Oh, they're as tough as, uh, as people can be. The uh, problem, of course, is they're getting older and uh, a number have died along the way. And this further delay is of uh, a great worry to them because some of them fear they will not live long enough to see this uh, process end. That's a uh, harsh reality. Well, I suppose, Mr. Budden, the reality is by prolonging this court process, more people who suffered the abuse could pass away. Obviously, with any group of people, that's a risk with this group of men who were at Mount Cashel a long, long time ago. Uh, that's, that's a real risk. Right. Now, let me ask you this a final question, Mr. Budden. You're, you're obviously well composed. You're a lawyer. You're used to being professional in a courtroom. You know, as a citizen of this province and as just as a, as a person, what has it been like representing uh, these people who really suffered unspeakable abuse that nobody denies happened? Uh, to represent them has been an honor. They're uh, a great group of clients. Uh, when we lost before the trial division, they were completely supportive. And uh, when we won before the Court of Appeal, they were pleased. But they're prepared for this uh, continuing battle. And they're, they and the team that we put together to do this appeal will continue. Now, in a statement today, the Roman Catholic Archdiocese said we have, quote, immense sympathy for those who suffer as a result of abuse, and we regret that this petition to appeal will prolong the legal proceedings of this case. Also, we ask for prayers for all involved in this sad matter as we continue to move forward. The Archdiocese will not be making any further comments at this time. Well, to another story now, there is an underlying theme about the pandemic that isn't discussed very often, and that is that destitution and impoverishment has fed this pandemic. Isolation and quarantines are aggravating factors in what has happened in the world. The demand for girls and boys, of course, for child sexual abuse and production of pornographic material is growing during the lockdown times and the, uh, the COVID-19 times. Now, millions of people around the world have been pushed into poverty as economies falter. In many places, that has squeezed children out of schools and into the streets to work for survival. Seti Arti has worked for decades rescuing children from that fate, and he fears an explosion of child trafficking, forced labor, and child marriage cases, noting the number of child sexual abuse cases has almost doubled during the pandemic. UNICEF data puts the number of child laborers in India alone at over 10 million. Businesses in the hospitality industry had a hard go of it this summer, but now that we're into the fall, what's in store? I'll speak with one business owner coming up.
The hospitality industry in this province has taken a major hit during the pandemic, but now the organization that represents those businesses has released some numbers that paint a picture of just how big those losses are. Hospitality Newfoundland and Labrador has reported that many restaurants saw revenues drop from 70 or $80,000 a month in 2019 to between 30 and $50,000 a month this year. And the 17 largest hotels in St. John's saw a 72% decrease in revenues this year compared to last. Joining me now is business owner Jason Brake. So you own three uh, businesses in St. John's, a restaurant, a bar, which we're in right now, and a hotel. What do you think when you hear those numbers from Hospitality Newfoundland and Labrador? I think the numbers are pretty close to where they are for us. Um, a lot of my friends that are in the hospitality industry all over have been coming to me and telling me what they're doing and we uh, collaborate and pass back numbers back and forth. And I know that we're experiencing uh, a major, major downfall in the industry and it looks like this fall is going to be a telltale for a lot of people in the industry. You own three businesses. You have your fingers in three different pies, I guess you could say. What has your experience been like? How hard has it been for you? Well, we all had to adapt for what was thrown at us. Thank goodness for the pedestrian mall. That helped out dramatically this summer. Uh, so we were able to make a little bit of money with the restaurant this year. Um, but most of that is going to be put towards surviving. And I think most everyone in the industry is like that. How long do you think you can keep going like this? I'm hoping that, you know, we've protected ourselves in the right way and we're going to be watching things to come and we're going to take advantage of as many stimulus packages as we possibly can to survive for another year to try to get through all of this. What do you see on the horizon? Do you think that we'll start seeing a slew of businesses start shutting down in the fall? I do. Right now we're wobbling. It's not going to be long and there's going to be a complete collapse. Tourism now is incredibly fragile, incredibly fragile. And I think November is the month to watch. And it's unfortunate to predict. And I don't want to be the naysayer here, but it looks like it looks like everything is coming down in October and November. And when you say that November is the month to watch, what should we be watching for? I'm afraid we're going to be witnessing bankruptcies, people who are leasing or renting, they're going to be vacating their uh, places, they're going to become empty again, and there's going to be very few players left in these industries. And it all depends on how, how financially sound they were going in, and I think that we're in a fortunate position as far as owners go. But with that being said, we're still looking at negative numbers for an entire year. So it's not profitable, it's how long you can stay alive in the negative. I think that if we get past Q1 in 2021, then we might be okay because, you know, there's talk about high speed testing, and that's the critical one to open up. Ontario to come to Newfoundland because that's 70% of the market. If there's no fear of them bringing COVID to the province, then it should be open. You know, we can't be afraid to open the borders, but we also got to listen to Fitzy because she knows what she's doing. All right, Jason Brake, thank you so much for speaking with me about this. Thanks again. It's good to see you. Well, in national political news, Parliament reopened today with a speech from the throne. And speaking on behalf of the Prime Minister, Governor General Julie Payette said this is not the time for austerity. She said the federal government will spend more money to support affected businesses and help Canadians who have lost work. Now, some MPs had hoped to see more specifics on combating climate change. Payette said government will move forward on the Atlantic Loop to help regions transition away from coal. Additionally, the government will transform how we power our economy and communities 
by moving forward with the Clean Power Fund, including with projects like the Atlantic Loop that will connect surplus clean power to regions transitioning away from coal, and support investments in renewable energy and next generation clean energy and technology solutions. And in an unusual move, the Prime Minister will, will address the nation at 8 o'clock island time tonight, 7.30 in most of Labrador. He asked all major television networks for time tonight, so stay tuned. Well, the latest on uh, post-tropical storm Teddy just west of Newfoundland now. That's going to race towards the uh, Strait of Belle Isle as we head through the overnight tonight. But that means by tomorrow morning, things are going to start to improve. We're going to see some lingering drizzle for most of us. Temperature is going to be quite mild as well. 14 degrees in St. John's, 13 in Corner Brook. And then those temperatures into the six, uh, six degree range for Lab City. But as we head through the overnight, or rather today, tomorrow afternoon, those temperatures are going to stay mild.
mild across the board. So 17 uh, degrees in St. John's. Those winds will stay breezy as well, 50 to 60 kilometers per hour. However, we, we should see the sunshine uh, peak out into the afternoon. And then up through Labrador, you're looking at temperatures in the teens for the southeast. Uh, Nain hanging on to about 8 degrees, those single-digit temperatures. Four in Lab City. However, as we head into the evening and overnight, we are looking at the potential for some flurries and winds will be breezy as well, 40 to 70 kilometers per hour. Thanks, Ashley. We're going to wind things down now with an international story. Hundreds of people lined up outside the U.S. Supreme Court today to pay their respects to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I think it's really important to remember that Justice Ginsburg wasn't just a fighter for progressive women. She was a fighter for all women. Ginsburg's flag draped casket arrived at the U.S. High Court this morning and it was greeted by more than a hundred of her former clerks. The revered liberal jurist died last week at the age of 87 after serving on the High Court in that country for 27 years. After a brief service, her coffin was moved to the court's front steps. Ginsburg's body will lie in repose there today and tomorrow. Bill and Hillary Clinton, who you saw there, were among the first to honor her on Friday. Ginsburg's body will lie in state in the U.S. Capitol building. She is the first woman to have that honor. And next week, she will be buried next to her husband in a private ceremony at Arlington National Cemetery. Yeah, so a remarkable woman for people mm -hmm. who've studied the law and have watched what's happening in the United States. Uh, and I just realized sort of looking right now, this is the first time, I'm not sure if you two realize this, but this is the first time the three of us have been together. It's been since, a long time. <laughs> since either, the three of us have been together, like in the room. It's yeah. er, early March, maybe February, I yeah, think. Yeah, I, I think it may have been February for sure. 2020. <laughs> That's my Halloween costume. I'm going as 2020 this year. Anyway, have a good night. <laughs> good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Good night.